A little over 10 years ago, I was in New York City meeting with uh, a little bit younger alum by the name of Mark Chen. Um, and we were talking about his experiences at the Kennedy Center. And he laid out a roadmap. And he said, you know, Corey, I'm, I'm going to come back to Utah at some point. I'm going to start a company. I'm going to build it. I'm going to grow it. And it's going to be amazing. And, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things. A lot of people have a lot of different plans and visions. But it has been pretty amazing to watch uh, that happen exactly as Mark predicted. Um, and so for the Kennedy Center, as we think about where you're going to be, what opportunities await you um, in your future, and how the Kennedy Center and all the opportunities you have here at BYU can prepare you for that, we could not think of anyone um, more suited to talk to you than Mark Chen, who is our honored alumni recipient for this year. As you know, we're in the middle of homecoming 2023. Um, this has been in the works, believe it or not, for a, a long time, almost a year. Um, but we are so pleased to welcome him. And the title of his presentation, which is Thinking Big and Showing Up, How to Work and Win on a Global Stage, not only encapsulates the message I think it's important for us to learn from, but also represents very, very effectively his life and the things that he has accomplished in every aspect, um, which I think is important to note. Um, from his professional background, um, Mark is an entrepreneur. Um, he's the co-founder and and CEO of SaltStack, which is an industry-leading enterprise security operations platform, uh, which also led to successful acquisition by VMware in 2020. He has other experiences across the business and technology sectors, including uh, working with Altiris, which eventually led to an IPO by Symantec. He joined a tech startup uh, earlier in, called Compliance 11, which was acquired by Charles Schwab. It sounds like he's, there's, there's timing and, and, uh, and, and good fortune uh, linked together with hard work and skill. Um, he's, he also worked for the investment um, side of Morgan Stanley in New York City, which is when we first connected. Um, as mentioned, and as you can guess, uh, Mark received a, a Bachelor of Arts here in the Kennedy Center in International Studies, which was the precursor to our international relations program, as well as an MBA in finance from the Marriott School. He uh, was an all-American high jumper and member of the US Olympic development team. And so as a, an athlete at BYU, he brought another uh, remarkable set of skills and accomplishments um, to what he does. He serves on the Forbes Technology Council, the Silicon Slopes Board, and is one of the founding members of the BYU Kennedy Center's International Advisory Board. Um, Mark lives in Highland um, with his wife and three children, although the three children are starting to spread out, uh, and we're glad to have uh, one of the three, two of the three children here today. Well, one. We had two. Um, spreading out. Um, he also enjoys traveling, cooking, cycling, and supporting other entrepreneurs. As you think about your future, we hope that you will think big and show up. And so we look forward to hearing from our honored alum from 2023, Mark Chen. Hey, everybody. Good to be with you. I'm so grateful that you guys uh, were willing to come out at 5 p.m., a little after 5 p.m. on a weekday. Um, thank you for the tacos. That's a good idea. Um, let me just get this set up here, and then we'll we'll get right started. Um, I've got to watch out what I say publicly in front of Corey, because he has a really long and good memory. Um, it might get me into trouble at some point in the future. So, um, As I mentioned, uh, it's an honor to be with you all here today. Um, it wasn't long ago that I was sitting probably closer to the back of the room, here in the Kennedy Center, um, taking classes, and was just so grateful when I was asked to come and present and share a few thoughts today about entrepreneurship, about the journey that all of you are on, um, and to share just a few insights that I think might be helpful, uh, a few anecdotes, and perhaps a few insights that could be useful as you consider your journey professionally and personally uh, in life. Um, Again, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to address all of you. I want to just first up front express my um, deep thanks uh, to Professor Benfell, Corey Leonard. Um, I've been a friend of Corey and 
folks like Jeff Ringer for, gosh, going on almost two decades now. And um, it's like, it was like building a startup in some respects, I think, in those early, early days there. Just, and so the foundation is solid. It's been laid by good people who've done amazing things here in the program. And I also wanted to thank the Kennedy Center Executive Committee for uh, the generous um, vote of confidence in, in receiving this award today. I want to thank my family and friends, um, all of you students and other honored guests who are in attendance today for, for, for being here. Um, let me actually advance here now. Um, I've, I've heard someone say that the students who graduate from the Kennedy Center either want to run the world, own the world, or ultimately save the world. Um, so you're a pretty varied group of individuals here um, when you think about the diversity of intent uh, that you each have. And so my hope is that regardless of what your personal goals are, that I'm able to provide you with something from my personal arsenal uh, of experiences, my per personal, professional, and educational journey that might be um, illuminating to some, pa uh, some aspect of your path going forward. When I was a student here at the Kennedy Center, uh, about 23 years ago, feels like a long time ago, maybe not that long ago, um, at the beginning of my junior year, uh, I made the goal to improve my Chinese. I grew up in Washington State, moved to Hong Kong when I was 15. And uh, I started studying Mandarin in Hong Kong. I had a good friend here at BYU by the name of Seth, um, who I attended classes with here. And um, he also shared this desire to improve his Chinese. And so uh, together we decided that it might be a good idea, since we weren't fluent, uh, to participate uh, in one of the immersion programs here and, and live in the foreign language student housing. So we, we spent a semester in the Chinese house, uh, and um, it was a great idea. It actually helped. Uh, my Chinese improved significantly that semester. Don't ask me to speak Mandarin to you now. But what I gained from that experience was that um, I, I gained more from being roommates with Seth, actually, than um, from the actual language experience itself. It was quite transformative, and I'll tell you why. Um, while in the Chinese house, I saw up close and personal how Seth spent his time and his energy um, he was involved in seemingly, uh, a seemingly endless number of activities on campus. He was on the BYU folk dance team. He was double majoring in economics and Chinese. He was a member of the Model UN team. I think he went to New York, perhaps with Corey at one point. I've, I've never had a roommate that knew um, exactly what he wanted out of his professional future um, quite like Seth and was so active in his pursuit, so vigilant in his pursuit of that. He eventually went on to attend Harvard Business School uh, and, um, and earned a degree from Columbia Law. I was inspired, to say the least, by this guy. He was amazing. And seeing his focus and his determination, I witnessed firsthand how he took life by the horns and assertively moved towards all of his goals with seeming ease and um, had a very clear plan for he, what he wanted to achieve in his future. Now, um, our time together caused me to think about what I was doing to prepare for my future, right? It's a question that we're probably all asking, you know, what does the future hold? You know, what do I have to bring to the table? Um, it's a very common question. But because of Seth's example, I became more committed to thinking about the kind of work experiences that could help me build towards my own. And so this led me um, through a series of, you know, evenings of deep thinking and some thought and some from talking to a few individuals about what they were planning on doing. I started to develop some big ideas, right? And um, I had three thoughts in my mind about what I wanted to do, because I was running track at BYU, as Corey mentioned, and I was spending multiple hours a day training and trying to improve myself there. Um, and I developed three um, distinct ideas in my mind about what I was hoping to accomplish and what I would hope to gain from, uh, from a work experience that summer. Um, and so I started to think big. Anyway, I, uh, all of those thoughts led me to reconnect with an old young men's leader from my time in Hong Kong. 
and uh, who was working in London for a major technology firm. And I proactively reached out to him and stated my goal for a summer job that could provide me with the professional development that I desired. And to my delight, he offered me a summer internship on the spot. Now, to just kind of rewind that a little bit, my thought was, if I'm going to spend time working, right, and taking time away from what was a very important and core activity at my, at, during uh, my time here at BYU and track, I want to make it work for me. And so I thought of three things. I had three criteria. One is that I wanted to work for a company that had a good brand. Um, ideally, I would get paid for my work, my work efforts. And third, that uh, I wanted it to be somewhere foreign or somewhere just completely, you know, I, I wanted it to be an international assignment somewhere. And so it, that was my first example, perhaps, of thinking a little bit outside of the box, right? Thinking about something that was going to expand my horizons and my opportunities. And uh, fortunately, um, you know, Corey did offer me an internship. Now, the international piece didn't work out. He switched jobs, moved from London to D.C., and that's where I ended up. But you know what? Um, I got two of the three, and that wasn't bad. So you've kind of heard the old adage that if you don't shoot, you can't score. Um, in this situation, I felt like I just hit a half-court buzzer-beating shot. Um, now, without that influence from Seth, I don't know if I would have had the confidence or the foresight, right, that exposure that I got to how he was thinking, how he was trying to do things, um, to really contact that old mentor in Hong Kong, that friend, and ask for this professional favor. Um, the internship ended up being extremely beneficial and I, as I was seeking out full-time employment after graduation. Um, it was a huge boon uh, to my resume, and it helped me to stand out among other job candidates as I interviewed. Um, being exposed to Seth's elevated career, uh, his planning process helped me to see beyond the immediate circumstances and to look towards my own future. And it, it was a great opportunity, one that I really treasure. Um, you've heard the phrase, it's been, it's been stated that you become the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but when it comes to relationships, I know that we are greatly influenced whether we like it or not, by those closest to us. They affect your way of thinking, what you believe is possible, your self-esteem, some of the decisions that you'll even make. And so my first bit of advice and counsel is to be very thoughtful as you consider the types of people that you surround yourself with. Um, you know, consider the goals and the values that they hold and whether they align, right? Do they have similar aspirations um, and, and drive. So seek out experts, mentors, professors, friends who inspire you to achieve the very, ve very best version of yourself. Those who inspire you, encourage you, and expect the best from you ultimately will be a huge asset through your professional journey. Okay. Morgan Stanley. Um, within the first month of, this is my second story here, of being married to my wife, Teresa. Teresa, where are you? <laughs> Hand up. Uh, we, were, we were just talking one evening uh, in our apartment about how we wanted to someday just have an adventure. And we got onto the topic of living and working in Manhattan, right? I had never been to Manhattan. I'd, lived, I'd been to Beijing, I'd been to Hong Kong, I'd been to a lot of other sort of big countries outside of our own. And, but I'd never been to Manhattan. It kind of seemed a little bit audacious and even a little bit intimidating um, at the time. But we were like, let's go and have an adventure and let's go live in Manhattan. Um, I'd grown up in Washington State, and at age 15, I moved to Hong Kong, as I mentioned. So I'd had some experiences living abroad and working in a big city. Um, I loved the vibe and the energy of Hong Kong. It was very dynamic. And um, so during graduate school, um, later, as I came back to BYU for graduate school, one of the um, uh, MBA professors that I really kind of looked up to as a mentor suggested that I interview with uh, a Wall Street firm called Goldman Sachs. And eventually, I um, interned for Goldman Sachs, and that turned into an experience with a private equity firm. Um, and, and eventually, though, I secured full-time employment at Morgan Stanley. Um, which I was very grateful for, in Manhattan, which was kind of the key, right? 
And um, it was a dream come true in a lot of ways for me. Our family of five, my oldest daughter Madeline is here with her fiance, and uh, it was a dream come true for our family, well, maybe for me and, uh, and Teresa. <laughs> and ultimately we, uh, we made our way to the city. Um, our family moved there and we lived in a 940 square foot apartment. Um, and we were just really excited about the opportunity. And so as luck would have it, just a few months after relocating our family to the city, the great financial crisis started to rear its ugly head. And um, this was 2007 and 8, and um, the markets began melting down and several banks went under. Um, we had many close friends who lost their jobs. Um, some of our friends who didn't lose their jobs that were here are here listening. Thanks for coming. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of firms actually went under as well, as you, as you know. So we had many close friends that lost their jobs. It was a difficult time for a lot of people in the financial services sector as well as others, and a difficult time for a lot of people um, on Wall Street. So as I approached my 32nd birthday, um, I felt very confused and frustrated by what was happening, by a, a little bit by the uh, work that I was doing, and what we thought was going to be an amazing experience actually turned in reality to be an extremely difficult um, situation. Um, I had now spent three years with Morgan Stanley, uh, but it had been fraught with a continuous anxiety that I felt over, you know, whether we were going to get laid off uh, or whether we were going to survive another round. Um, I realized, uh, Teresa and I realized one day uh, just how maybe anxiety uh, ridden <laughs> our conversations were when one night our four year old daughter. Uh, was praying that daddy wouldn't get burned. Um, <clears throat> apparently, she had overheard our conversations and us talking about the latest rounds of, of layoffs, um, and she understood that getting fired was something pretty painful. So I think that she was in that mindset. Um, so I'd spent a lot of time and energy trying to secure this job and to be successful, but there came a point when I knew that I needed a change. Um, I'd learned so much, and I'm grateful for the experiences that I had on Wall Street, but it became evident that this wasn't going to be the, th the place or the thing that I was going to be doing for the next 30 years. And so I sought out the advice of a close friend, hoping to receive some counsel and inspiration around the decision uh, and what I, might, what I might choose to do next. Um, I distinctly remember our first conversation. The friend asked me what I was deeply passionate about and that I... <laughs> and it was interesting because I couldn't come up with a single thing. I was so immersed in that Wall Street environment that I just I couldn't think outside of probably the 14 hours a day that I was spending there. Um, and um, in my mind, I, I really deeply tried, you know, so I was like, uh, good food, right? Uh, exercise, BYU athletics, you know, like I had, I was kind of blank. But this troubled me that there, here I was in my early 30s, and I couldn't really answer his question honestly. Um, and so wisely, uh, this friend narrowed the focus of his questions and asked me to go, uh, asked me about, uh, asked me questions about what I was passionate about and turned that into what variables I would want to be true to, what variables would I want to be true about my next work experience. So he went from, talking about, you know, what are you deeply passionate about, to then saying, you know, what do you want to be true in your next work um, situation? And, um, um, and what was important to me when considering the, those different work circumstances? Um, those discussions led me to identify three things that at the time were really important elements to my next, uh, my next work opportunity. One, um, through those discussions, I realized that it was really important. The people that I worked with were extremely important. I wanted to work with people that I liked and trusted, and actually trusted and liked in that order, right? Um, I wanted to work with people that were honest and, you know, integral, and that ultimately um, I could trust to do the work. And I wanted to make sure that I could trust their, their professional competence. Two, I wanted control, I called it control over my own destiny, 
And uh, um, eventually I changed that phrase to um, having greater impact. I didn't, I, I realized that you never really have full control over your own destiny in life. Um, but you can, you can do certain things um, in life to have impact and to feel good about your contributions. And that's what I wanted. And then third was uh, I was looking for an appropriate risk adjusted return to my time. And so I wanted to make sure that there was an appropriate return on my investment and time. Um, and so I called that unlimited financial upside, right? Again, thinking big. Um, clarifying these points gave me a sense of confidence and direction. And from there, I was then advised to think about industry verticals that I found interesting. And you can kind of like see how we're going from really wide to more narrow. Of all my professional experiences, the one industry that captured my attention most was the tech sector. There was an exciting energy around technology. Um, companies were growing, they were getting acquired every year, and I had spent some time working for a tech company before graduate school, and it felt familiar to re-enter that arena. So as I thought about those opportunities, tech was resonant. Now, I've got some advice around this that I'll share towards the end that I'll that I'll come back to. But fast forward a couple of months. Um, one day I received a phone call from, a random phone call actually, from a friend who was launching a financial services tech software company and needed someone like me to help grow the business in New York City through their next phase. Um, on face value, this job wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, they were basically hiring for a sales executive position in that, in that role. But as I thought about the opportunity further, I realized that this job would marry the skills that I had acquired on Wall Street and the knowledge with the aptitude I had, I knew that I had for sales. And it also fulfilled three elements that I had recently discussed, the three elements that I discussed with this mentor. Um, and so I was going to be able to work with people that I liked and trusted. I was going to have the control over my own destiny that I sought and, uh, and the autonomy. And ultimately, the job would afford me the potential for, you know, technically unlimited upside as I was, as I was trying to close deals for this new startup and the job, you know, gave us the opportunity to kind of see a, a good favorable structure, both on the equity side as well as the commission. So it also had the added perk that it was a super early stage fintech, right, which was interesting because I didn't want to just jump into somebody else's you know, baked pie, so to speak, right? I wanted to do something that was impactful and that was shaping and that was, that was new. Um, so I was going to be able to witness this startup grow in a very intimate way, and I was going to be able to make a difference, um, and that was really exciting. So this job fit every personal category that I had created. It was an, in an area that I had skills and proficiency. It was a startup that I felt passionate about, um, and I knew that I was going to receive great experience, and it had major economic potential. So on we went. And um, I went to work invigorated. That was the difference for me, right? Like I went from a situation where every day was uncertain, anxiety ridden, right? Those were probably some cues for me and maybe for you in the future as you're thinking about your work situation. Um, the kinds of things that you're going to learn about the things that are resonant and good for you. But I went to work invigorated and I felt aligned with what my career goals and values were. Um, I was able to have some great success um, as I was growing that, that territory and that company. And eventually, I was asked to expand that team uh, into Europe. So success in one opportunity led to success, or at least open doors and opportunities in others. And, um, and that provided me with a really fascinating international business experience that I desired to have. So this job turned out to be an ideal opportunity because it allowed me to have a front row seat to the inner workings of an early stage tech startup. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? There's always all three of those anytime you're in a startup. And without having to shoulder a lot of the founder risk that is inherent whenever you're building something from zero to one. Um, so because of that opportunity, uh, and because it was aligned with the skills, expertise, and passion that I possessed, it allowed me to earn more than I'd ever earned up to that point in my career. And this provided me with um, a buffer of capital and confidence to eventually bet on myself down the road 
in a way that I hadn't done previously and to take more career risks down the road. So um, we're going to move to the next phase of this uh, career journey here, and we're going to talk about uh, passion versus proficiency. And now, the Compliance 11 experience that I had had reinforced to me that passion really truly is a key element to happiness in whatever job that I would have henceforth. Um, but even more paramount to passion, I learned that I needed to have a job where I had confidence and skill that set me aside or set me apart from my peers. I was passionate about the idea of having a Wall Street job, you know, um, the glitz, the glamour, wh whatever that, would, that kind of drew me, the, the intellectual curiosity and learning that, that I had there. But in the end, I didn't actually feel that it utilized the greatest skills and proficiencies that I individually possessed. Um, this tech startup did, though, and as a consequence, my skills were optimized to their full potential, and, um, and I ended up being successful, and as I was successful, my, my passion for this job uh, only increased and was fueled further. So um, as the CEO of a, uh, of a startup, I developed a paradigm. This, this, qu this actually closely mirrors um, Jim Collins' hedgehog concept, and uh, although one of the areas is slightly different. But when passion, opportunity, and proficiency, or your skills, converge, special things can happen. And I call that professional nirvana. Um, I refer, uh, in 2011, the financial tech startup that I was having success at eventually was sold to Charles Schwab. And given how involved I'd been in driving value for that company and living so close to the decision making, I developed a desire to shoulder more of those founder responsibilities um, in, in my experiences. And so I developed a desire um, to, to go out and to venture off and to do my own startup at that point. And so after several years of working for other people, um, I was now personally feeling the pull to build and to create and to found and to you know, develop something that, uh, that I could kind of put the personal stamp on myself. I was ready to bet on myself. Um, fast forward to um, SaltStack. In 2012, I eventually co-founded SaltStack, which is a software automation platform and, and security automation framework that's used by many of the global you know, 2000 uh, companies in the world. I was the CEO of this company from 2012 to 2020. Uh, eventually, we were acquired by a major consolidator out of Palo Alto called VMware. Um, this company began, it was an interesting journey. This company began as an open source software company, which essentially meant that the technology was free. People could download it, they could contribute to it, um, they could use it to their heart's content. And our challenge and opportunity was how do we make open source and, and free something that people are actually willing to pay for. It's kind of like selling ice to, you know, indigenous groups. So, <laughs> um, in cold climates. Um, <laughs> the, um, the importance of understanding, so there were several lessons that I learned. I'm going to kind of go off script and just share a few insights that I learned here um, about the experiences at SaltStack, and then I'm going to go into a few other points here before opening things up to Q&A for you guys. But, um, you know, I, I think that in building a business, if any of you have, and how many of you might have a sliver of interest in doing something entrepreneurial in your lives at some point? A few of you. That's great. Like I said, we've got three different swaths, right? Build, own, you know, uh, what was the third one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, and so as you think about your varied interests, I mean, you might be the equivalent of a founder and a nonprofit at some point. And as you think about um, that, one of the one of the key elements that I learned was the importance of understanding the problem that you're solving for the audience or the constituent groups that you're going to be working with. Whatever your community is, whoever your customers are, be very thoughtful about solving for that upfront. You will save massive amounts of time. Right, you'll you'll save time and money. In fact, um, if you do that and do that well, so take the time to think through the problem-solution equation. 
um, th this company, when we eventually figured out who we were selling to, <clears throat> we were able to turn it into a company that, again, mentioned, sold to many of the Fortune 2000 companies across the globe, companies like Bloomberg or Goldman Sachs, Intuit, NASA, um, JPL, their uh, jet propulsion laboratories, a, a number of really fascinating and interesting companies. Their developers were using this platform to actually deploy and configure and then eventually secure cloud infrastructure, which is just means that people were able to do their jobs in running their in technology infrastructure more efficiently and at greater scale. Um, true to my point uh, about sort of working with people that you trust and like, this, this point of, I, I really learned firsthand about the importance of hiring and working with great people, right? They don't always have to agree with you, right? But is the person smart, hardworking, humble, right? Is that individual somebody that's going to um, have a founders or at least a, a startup mindset, right? Somebody that has grit, determination, a willingness to kind of stay until the job gets done. Those are all key things in startups. Um, ultimately, as you define the culture <clears throat> of your business um, and the strategy, you'll know sort of what your profile is, what you're looking for. And, um, and as you define that with clear, uh, with clear terms, I think that it then does help uh, immensely as you start to scale and grow out a business so that you have like, not always like-minded, but um, like-hearted people in terms of the way that they want to be determined in growing something. <clears throat> I learned some great lessons about trusting and empowering employees. Um, you know, a, a business is never a business of one, right? Businesses are always businesses that are built on the backs and the hearts and the minds of uh, everybody that is is employed there. And so as a leader, it's very important to know and understand sort of how to lead, how to motivate, how to love. <clears throat> and then ultimately, um, the important, I learned also the importance of maintaining balance in your personal life. Admittedly, there were, there was a stretch of years there where things got a little hairy and dicey, right? Inevitably, I remember being 15 hours away from not making payroll in our early years, and that created a lot of stress. And so when you're under immense stress like that, eventually you pull out, but uh, when you have that kind of stress, you get laser focused on solving those problems. No excuse, but I would say, do all you can to preserve personal time, to protect and preserve you know, the childhood of your, of your kids if you've got them eventually. Um, do all you can to just really create an environment there where you, know, you might be feeling that burden, but try not to burden um, those that are closest to you in doing so. And then ultimately, um, you know, I think it's important that, that you maintain a sense of humility. Um, these businesses at the end of the day are just businesses, right? These organizations that we create are just organizations. They're temporal in nature, right? They can come and they can go. And so I think it's important that <clears throat> even though while you're investing immense amounts of time and energy and resource into these things, and even though they feel like the most important thing in the world, that you shouldn't let your company, right? Strive to really not let your company define who you are. Um, you, you, are not, um, you are not the company and you'll not be the CEO and co-founder forever. And so don't let that be the thing that you base your confidence on. Anyway, those were a few thoughts and, and lessons there from the SaltStack experience, which I was tremendously grateful for <clears throat> and that I feel like really created kind of a refining experience for me professionally and personally. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to move on. You guys okay if I move on to a few lessons before we go to Q&A? All right, and I, I'll, I'll be quick about this. Uh, I'm going to just fly through these, and then I'm going to close and then let you guys ask any questions that you want, um, if there are any. My first uh, point that I wanted to raise is that um, on this topic of success and life success, pro I'll call it more professional success than life success, I think that people in life are successful for two, not just two main reasons, but I've, I've listed two core reasons here. One is that you've either developed a certain level of expertise in the field that you're, in, that you're working in. You've acquired a deep skill or knowledge or know-how of something, and you need to become that go-to person in the environment where you work, right? Um, so that people trust your, your knowledge, your expertise, and, um, and I think that will serve you well <clears throat> if you become an expert. Two, is that 
individuals succeed because they've created valuable innovation, right? They've done something that they're able to identify. It provides a unique insight, a process, <clears throat> excuse me, or value uh, before the rest of the world has discovered that, or they've done it in a unique way, right? They've, got, they've developed a unique twist on that, and they exploit that insight such that they're able to make that profitable. Um, I, I jokingly say, avoid a midlife crisis and get out into the world. Take advantage of every opportunity that you have um, to learn as much as you can. Really, it's not about midlife crises. This is about learning, right? This is about getting out, taking knowledge from where you can get it, whether it's formal or informal. Um, there's so much that you can glean from people, from life experiences, from travel, from informal settings where there may not necessarily be a degree associated with it, but do all you can to become a lifelong learner. Um, this is a period of time in your lives where you have a very unique opportunity, and I would dare say responsibility. To um, And you have a calling card, whether you realize this or not, in your seat as students, to call on whoever you want to call on. You could call on the CEO of Nike if you wanted to tomorrow, and you could explain who you are, what your interest in reaching out to them is, and nobody is going to fault you one iota for that. In fact, they probably will admire and respect you more for having the courage to do that. So I, I call this section Explore, Experience, and Experiment, right? Um, and get knowledge wherever you can. All right. Um, there's great value in breadth, having breadth. Um, and eventually, right, as I talked about, specializ specialization and depth will work in your favor long term. Uh, but get as many experiences that you can right now. Internships, study abroads. Um, take advantage of this amazing resource that is the Kennedy Center here, right? Doors will be open to you. The alumni network that is almost 7,000 strong, I believe, is a network of willing people who have sat in your, sat in your chair at one point. Um, this is an interesting one. The more successful you become, the more criticism that you will face. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable and getting uncomfortable feedback. Uh, do it now, and it will benefit your leadership later on. All right, uh, do well in your studies, but don't ever forget that your job now is ultimately to get a job. Um, and I'm not sort of telegraphing what you should do, right? Everybody's going to leave BYU and move on to do different things. Um, but if you have a career in mind, uh, that'll become a very important mindset to adopt. Somebody asked me earlier, how early do you, how early do you think is too early to get an internship? And I said, do it now. Um, do not sacrifice your soul. Uh, this is maybe my conclusion here, which is ultimately... Um, do not sacrifice your soul on the altar of success. Your biggest concern in this life should be your relationship with God and your relationship with your family. Um, it is truly, um, it, this is a factual statement, that no worldly success will compensate for failure in the home. And when I look at my greatest accomplishments in my life, they're not my career successes, they're ultimately my family. <clears throat> um, it, um, so I, I'm just going to conclude by um, expressing my gratitude the way that I started here for this opportunity, for the opportunity to be back here uh, in a place that I love with people who I admire and respect, and um, I'm grateful for this opportunity, and um, thank you for it. Thank you. got a, just a few minutes. Um, we're going to invite you to come up and be brave. Stand up at the microphone since we're recording this for other students as well. And just tell us your name and what you're studying. And uh, we have a few minutes to ask some questions of Mark, please. Neil Millman, a geographer, sociologist, and social entrepreneur, uh, running a, a nonprofit. 
Uh, for myself, I know the role that Epiphany and Revelation plays in getting answers. You haven't touched much on it, but could you state a little bit more about how Epiphany has guided your pathway to getting to where you are now? You know, it's really interesting when I think about a professional or personal epiphanies, those that have come through the Spirit. I, I definitely believe that the Spirit plays a major guiding role in all of our lives. Um, I'm a big believer in this principle of going, um, acquiring as much knowledge and information and insight as you possibly can on your own, um, and then offering up a very heartfelt prayer and then going to work to see what happens. Um, I, in some situations, I've received very clear answers, and in other situations, I've just had to keep my feet moving forward. Um, and it's in, the, in that motion of moving forward that um, keen insights have emerged. Um, it's in the act of doing that, uh, that the path becomes uh, more visible and illuminated before each of us, I believe. The other thing that I'll say about life epiphanies <clears throat> and learning, and even epiphanies in work, is that, um, as you probably noticed through my presentation, each one of the opportunities that I worked on, right, each one of the companies that I've been involved in came about because of a personal relationship. It wasn't always that I was actively networking, but oftentimes it was because I had a network and people were aware of my goals and the things that I wanted to do and the skill set that I brought to the table and doors were miraculously opened up. And so as you think about building a nonprofit, I think that that same process applies. Thank you. I think it's so cool you did sports and like so many cool majors and stuff in your college. How did you find balance in all those pursuits? It's a good question. <laughs> Um, admittedly, I wasn't the best at it. I mean, I came back thinking that I was going to be pre-med, and I just got buried, right? I had this idea that, you know, there were three noble professions in life. It was a fixed mindset, you know, business, law, medicine, you know, and, uh, and, and I just realized that, you know, to my point, that I needed to do something that I was going to be really strong in and that I could have success in. And, uh, you know, those early chem classes, you know, just killed me. So <laughs> now, your, your question was more about balance and less about sort of academic uh, performance. And what I would say is um, this principle will apply and be carried into um, your life later on, actually, af actually after you have, you know, um, you know, after you've kind of started down your professional track. And that is life is a little bit unpredictable. You can plan as best as you possibly can. Uh, but life always throws little curveballs at you, right? Um, that uh, that sometimes make like perfect, harmonious, you know, Zen balance possible. And so you just do what you best. You, you do your very best, I think, to focus on the problem at hand. Clayton Christensen, who was actually one of my first board advisors, used to talk about the jobs that need to be done. And so I think that there's an order of prioritization that you can go through in your life. And I think that um, that order of prioritization isn't just on, based on what's due or what's timely or what is sort of getting the most heat and pressure. Um, I think that you need to kind of weigh what your values are as well, right, and kind of look at things on a more macro level as well to determine whether or not something, I realize I'm speaking in sort of general terms, but whether something um, aligns with your values, right, and whether it really deserves the time and attention and importance that we're giving to it. Uh, you mentioned learning to get comfortable with taking criticism. Um, do you have any specific recommendations on how to uh, not take criticism personally to yourself, but personally to your work, and channeling it into furthering your goals? That's such a good question. I'm not perfect at this. I think everybody, <clears throat> you know, the question, how do you develop thick skin? How do you, how do you sort of utilize the 
the critique, the feedback that you're receiving in such a way that allows you uh, to then emerge stronger on the other side and also not, not just you personally, but also the relationship. Um, and, you know, we live in a really interesting time right now where, um, you know, much of what you do and say is out in the public domain, right? With Twitter slash X or LinkedIn or your social media posts, um, you know, for the first time ever, you know, things, things are out there. And so um, I would say that um, pausing is a really, like, I'm just going to give you a few, like, practical tactics, but um, pausing, maybe taking a deep breath, restating, right, allows you, to, it creates a little bit of space, right? And this is just sort of, like, very practical. Um, and, and then I think sometimes in the act of getting somebody to restate, you're able to clarify understanding because sometimes when you're processing emotionally what somebody's critiquing you on or saying, um, you know, you interpret it one way and maybe they've meant something entirely different. Um, you know, if in your, if in your work, it's not an emotional um, critique that you're getting from somebody, meaning that it's not just a, you know, a pointed critique, um, about something you've said or done. And if it's something that is based off of kind of a track record of performance, let's call it, um, I, I think that as a leader, it's our responsibility to actually absorb that, right? Um, and to take the time that you need to kind of process that in a way that you can come back with um, some meaningful thoughts about, you know, a acknowledging what they've critiqued you on um, and ways that you think that you might be able to improve. So. I don't know, it's, it's a really interesting thing because as the CEO or as a leader, right, you, you might be a, um, a Relief Society president or, you know, a, a neighborhood watch leader or a PTA president or something like that. Um, because we're inherently flawed and imperfect, we're never going to do things perfectly. And so I think we just need to kind of open up, open up ourselves to the fact that there will be many moments where somebody's not going to like the things that you do and it doesn't make them a bad person. It just means that, you know, the way that they're experiencing us and the things that we do might, uh, you know, might be tweaked. And sometimes I think that, you know, you can just agree to disagree as well. And that's perfectly fine as well. You bet. Thanks for the question. Thank you again.